We cannot forget that we are part of a whole. Let's reconnect and stand united. Trees and Seeds is a global movement to unite forest and ocean conservation worldwide through film activists, bringing together local community activism and global education through film screening, panels, cleanups, tree plantings, workshops, art, and music. Our collective effort to conserve the forest, the ocean, and the flora and fauna gives us all strength. We must take collaborative action across all stakeholders to push for systemic change from communities, governments, enterprises, and NGOs. Together, in locations around the world, our global team, Blue Community members, and local partners are uniting to harness the power of film to bridge local and global knowledge gaps. Just as our human health is determined at a cellular level, the health of our planet is determined by the health of our communities. We believe that it starts in our backyards, in our local communities that make up our one global community. It's how we work and collaborate with these local groups, the experts that deeply understand their local barriers and concerns, and how we can best support these local efforts that drive real change to protect our land and oceans. Take part in this global movement by joining an event, hosting an event, watching and sharing our film album, or acting as an individual. Trees and Seeds feel sustainable connections that allows us to preserve and conserve the planet we share with our neighbors. Visit the Trees and Seeds website to join this worldwide festival. Welcome everybody on Zoom, on YouTube, on Facebook, or Welcome to everyone who might be watching this uh, recording later today or during the week. Um, I'm Mark Minimo, Director of Advocacy at Plastic Oceans International. We have a great panel for you today and a great topic being the Global Plastics Treaty that is currently being negotiated. Uh, but before I explain you a bit more about that and about our festival, Trees and Seas, I would like to introduce to you our amazing panelists of today. First, uh, I would like to bring on Vivian Clarion, third councilwoman of the San Pedro Garza Garcia Municipal Council in the state of Nuevo León in Mexico. Hi, Vivian. Welcome. Hi. Thank you, Mark, um, for having me. Very exciting. Great. Vivian is an exceptional public servant who combines a solid educational foundation in accounting and a master's in administration with specialized sustainability training from MIT. Her leadership as a councilwoman championing projects and waste management, tree planting, and air quality positions her as a practical problem solver for her community challenges. Engaged as a board member in environmental groups and a certified climate reality leader, Vivian's collaborative ethical and communicative skills alongside her vision and partnership building make her an ideal stakeholder in the sustainability scene and an ideal panelist for today's panel. Next, uh, Laura Nieminen, Senior Project Administrator at the Global Plastics Policy Center at the University of Portsmouth. Welcome, Laura. Hello, Mark. Thanks for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Laura is a Senior Project Administrator at the Global Plastics Policy Center based at the University of Portsmouth, UK. While she has a personal interest in high seas fisheries and addressing illegal unreported and unregulated fishing through her BSc and MSc studies. Her current work revolves around supporting the UNEP process and negotiations on the Global Plastics Treaty. Her research, in addition to the Global Plastics Treaty, includes consumer behavior towards single-use plastics in Portsmouth, UK, exploring the connections between the plastics life cycle and climate change, and analyzing circularity potential within plastic and waste management policy frameworks in Asian countries. Welcome. And last but not least, Jessica Vandenberg, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington and Ocean Nexus. Hi, Jessica. Welcome. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Very excited. Great. Jessica is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington, drawing on political ecology, critical social sciences, and multimodal ethnographic methods 
Her research explores questions of power, knowledge, and equity related to ocean governance. She focuses on the rise of corporate environmental governance in marine restoration and remediation, as well as paths towards decolonizing these spaces to prioritize diverse ways of knowing, reflexive and relational thinking and nature cultural relations. Wow, that was a huge introduction of the three of you. I hope everybody understands what we're gonna be talking today about with these great panelists. So welcome everybody. Um, today's panel is, as you've seen already in the introduction video and the nice virtual backgrounds that we have, is part of our Global Trees and Seas Film Activism Festival. This year is already the third edition and also the third year that we organize these types of panels. Um, at the same time, in many locations around the globe this week is a week of action, of tree planting, cleanups, workshops, and also dialogues with communities and experts. Um, so today's panel will be about the Global Plastics Treaty and how national, subnational, and local execution of policies will be essential for an effective treaty. Uh, we don't want a treaty that sounds really nice on paper, but in practice is not generating any change. So we're going to be talking about some local realities, gaps and barriers that we should consider when negotiating this treaty, uh, what information flows maybe currently are missing, how do we make sure that national action plans will truly be effective, and also how a global treaty could solve historical inequities in communities. So for those of you present in Zoom or YouTube or anywhere else you're going to be watching this, this recording, uh, the treaty to end plastic pollution, which we're going to be talking about, uh, is being negotiated at this moment by all UN country members. Um, it, it started these negotiations in November 2022, and a final text of the treaty is expected by the end of 2024. So that's only one year and a few months away. Um, so the goal of this global treaty is to end plastic pollution uh, during its entire life cycle. I think this is really important to mention. This is not a treaty to and plastic pollution when it's already waste, when it's already in the environment. The idea is to regulate plastic pollution during its entire life cycle. Um, so the next negotiating meeting will be in November this year, only in two months time. And it's the third session of five. So that will mean we're already halfway negotiations. Pretty important. Uh, the latest news about the, these negotiations is uh, this week, a draft text has been published. So now we finally at least know a bit more about, okay, how the UN and the Secretariat of these negotiations think that all countries could be able or are able to agree on solving plastic pollution. Uh, so this is a really big deal. This text, this text is out and will be the main input for the negotiations uh, in November. Anyway, so th that is a bit of the instruction, the introduction of the global plastics treaty so we all know what we're going to be talking about something is going on on a global level a lot is going on on national subnational and local level and hopefully today with these amazing panelists we're going to dive a bit deeper into those realities um so to start with a more general question for for, for all three of you um so from your point of view um what is your expectation and hope for this global plastics treaty to end plastic pollution. And I would like to start with Vivian to, to answer this question first. What is your hope for the street? Well, my hope and expectation is commitment. Commitment through action and cooperation in all the levels, global, national, and local. And also for the individual and the business and the industry, like in a holistic approach, I would like for it to have clear targets and timelines. If we don't have that treaty, I think, or I, what I would expect to happen is that we will be throwing the problem as we have been doing, like for the future generations or for somebody else. So that treaty will make us all accountable. And that's what I expect and I hope it would do. Great, thank you, Vivian. So you mean it's not only the countries committing to this treaty, everybody needs to be on board. Yes, we all we are all part of the problem, and I'm sure we are all part of the solution. Okay, thank you, Vivian. And uh, Jessica, what do you think about it? What are you expecting or hoping for? Yeah, um, 
what I'm hoping is that what we come up with is not necessarily just solely effective solutions, but equitable solutions. Um, I think that part of that is acknowledging that this is a common problem, but we have differentiated responsibilities and capabilities and recognizing that throughout the treaty um, and the treaty negotiation process. I also think that something that needs to be centered more is a precautionary principle where human and environmental health are top priorities. Um, and I also think that we need to um, uphold a more transformative uh, way of looking at uh, polluter pay principles that aren't strictly reliant on incentive-based mechanisms, but also regulatory mandates um, that are really putting accountability onto industry. Great, thank you, Jessica. Laura? Well, I hope that the treaty forms a solid foundation that we can build upon in future COPs. I hope it can capture the complexity of plastics in a sufficient way. I mean, plastics are everywhere, be it in forms of products, materials, pollution, and not forgetting the greenhouse gas emissions and the connections of plastic pollution with the climate change. I'd also like to see realistic but still ambitious objectives and targets with pretty strong accountability and compliance measures because we don't want to make the mistakes of the Paris Agreement. And we already know that voluntary wish lists, they won't take us far. Um, and we also have to bear in mind that this agreement is going to be, uh, or this is going to be an agreement that has a massive number of stakeholders and sectors and plastic pollution and the chemicals, they impact millions of people. So cooperation and support, it really needs to be at the forefront. So could I, say that we all agree that a treaty is necessary or or is it a question more of okay we need a treaty but only if it works in a certain way i could just hop in here and say we need a treaty <laughs> that works <laughs> because you think countries can't solve it on, a, on their own no, I think because it's a global problem, we pretty much need need the global approach to this whole whole situation. Vivian, yeah, you want I, to? Ah, uh, Jessica first. <laughs> sorry, I, I just want to echo what Laura is saying. It, you know, this is a transboundary issue. We live in a globalized world, um, and we need effective coordination because what we've seen is fragmented efforts just lead to um, exacerbation of the problem in some places or um, neglect of the problem in other places. Exactly. Think, Vivian? Yes, maybe we focus a lot of the environmental aspects, but we need to think also on the social aspects of the of pollution and the economic barriers that each country has because we are not all the same. So yeah, global treaty, I think it's something that we need. Um, maybe politically, it's not as a, in certain countries, it's a like a green banner that you can use and people will want you to do environmental things, but there are certain countries that it's gonna make everything more expensive or they don't have enough infrastructure to take care of the problem. And that involves a chunk of money that some countries don't have. So yeah, that's something to consider too. Great, thank you. I think the, the question I have for Laura goes exactly in the same direction as what you're mentioning, Vivian, and also Jessica, because uh, many delegations in the last rounds of negotiations and also what we read in the submissions of the different countries, Everybody's talking about national action plans. Uh, some use national action plans more in a voluntary manner, like every country knows their own reality best. So they should decide what kind of action is, is the best for them. And other countries use it as a way of saying, no, this treaty has to be legally binding. And what is legally binding needs to be transformed in national action plans. Those, things, those two things are different or it doesn't really matter as long as there's a national action plan. Um, I think first it's good to remind ourselves that national action plans, they can serve two pretty important purposes. So firstly, as you said, Mark, you know, 
national action plans, they're extremely helpful in translating international commitments into national action. And then also there's the different country contexts that require the tailoring of these pathways through which those individual member states can then implement those global obligations and progress towards those global targets in a concerted fashion. And then secondly, national action plans, they can also serve as this strategy to coordinate and align existing national efforts of different stakeholders in different sectors and provide that legal and political framework for the meaningful action. Um, so in short, yes, it does make a difference because if you have national action plans that are voluntary, uncoordinated, unmonitored, they are less effective in reaching their targets in the planned timeframe, if at all. And sometimes we have no way of even knowing if the train has left the station, essentially whether the government has even kept implementing the action plan after its entry into force. So we all know plastic pollution is a global problem, but the national actions need to be coordinated for that very reason, so that we can ensure that we are taking coherent action. And it's not enough just to uh, mandate the coming up with a national action plan, you also need to mandate the contents and, and obligate some of those aspects. So if you don't do that, it leads to uncoordinated efforts, definitions and metrics, and that's the exact opposite of what we need. So uh, it's better that they're legally binding. And there's another important aspect. So then when you add those country contexts on top of the binding aspects, you get this true power combo that allows us to then avoid the counterproductive setting of global obligations and targets that in reality they're unattainable due to several and and sometimes really unique limitations thank you laura i think that's also something that i've been hearing from some countries promoting voluntary measures not for themselves they say it's for the countries who might not be able to catch up with the rest of the world so it's not fair to them to put legally binding and, and forcing them to change when they might not have the technology or capacities. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, those proposals are being used by countries who should know better and have all the knowledge and all the technology. And, and they are promoting it for themselves as well, not naming any names. But um, so it's, it's a bit funny that, to see how, how the, the concept of national action plans is being used uh, by many different countries. Uh, that want to say that, okay, some lesser developed countries need it to be voluntary and not legally binding. Exactly. Um, so next question for Jessica. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to be present at the presentation of the report that you co-authored called Towards an Equitable Approach to Marine Plastic Pollution. Um, I thought, in my opinion at least, it, it presented a novel way of looking at the impacts of plastic pollution on coastal communities. Um, so why do you feel it was necessary to investigate equity and marine plastic pollution in the first place? Yeah, um, I think that the problem marine plastic pollution is um, innately an equity issue. There's clear um, disproportionate burdens of the problem, specifically coastal and island communities and communities that are highly dependent upon marine resources are the ones that bear the brunt of the problem more so than other nations. Um, so that was sort of the starting point is we know this is a clear equity and justice problem, but what are the other equity and justice dimensions that aren't um, being brought into the, the broader discussions on plastic pollution? And so that was sort of the starting point. And we brought in a group of around um, 30 uh, scholars and practitioners to sort of talk through some of the issues that um, are really present in, in this problem. Um, and we, we s developed this um, sort of thematic framework of sort of the equity issues that we see. And the first one being responsibility. Um, we talk about that, that already has come up in this conversation. Um, responsibility is a clear equity issue. Um, and what we see right now is, um, that responsibility is often deflected onto um, individual consumers or um, to municipalities and the role of um, industry and their responsibility in this is sort of reframed into um, uh, these different types of solutions that don't necessarily transform um, the supply chains. Uh, 
The other side of this is um, deflection of blame. Um, we had a case study that looked at this um, with fishers and a ghost gear. And uh, although this is a major problem, there's sort of this disproportionate focus on that as part of the marine plastic pollution problem that ignores these other drivers or um, major root causes. Um, we also looked at problems revolving around knowledge production and who is, who's, at the, who's at the table, who are the stakeholders who really have um, leverage and a voice in negotiation processes. Um, and another really major thing that we found is the way that we talk about impacts. Um, it's, it's really been narrowly focused on economic and physical health, but there's a lot of well-being impacts um, that are not as widely discussed. And those are the impacts that those frontline communities are um, exposed to very frequently. Um, so yeah, it kind of started off with this really simple distributional effect and then it kind of cascaded into, this is a complex equity issue and it really needs to be at the forefront of how we're discussing solutions so that those problems don't get left behind. So could you say, as you say, we talked about it a bit before already in this panel, when you, we say everybody's part of the problem, everybody's part of the solution, but maybe some groups are more responsible and have more accountability than others? Yeah, um, and yeah, that gets into this common but differentiated responsibility and coordination. We're all, we all have to do something, but we also have to recognize where is everyone's starting point, and that's different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, so next question for Vivian, more of a general question to, to explain people also a bit more about the work you do, because maybe for a lot of us, it's, it's hard to imagine, but what is it like to be a councilwoman? And why did you choose to become one and make sustainability one of the key issues of your work? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mark. Um, well, being a councilwoman has been very uh, a very rewarding experience because I have been able for the past years to kind of shape my community and do different things that move us toward a more sustainable place to, to live. But I started as an activist first. Uh, my first child was born 17 years ago and that kind of like changed me because I started thinking about uh, what are the resources that we have? What's the quality of the water that we drink, the air that we breathe and what are we doing with all our waste. So I started to uh, study that and we have very bad air quality in, in the whole urban area in Nuevo León, in Mexico. So I helped organize the first protest asking uh, the government for a cleaner air. And that's when the opportunity of being a councilwoman presented itself. And I thought this is my chance to help build a city with a uh, longer vision, not for the people, not only for their generation right now, but also for future generations. So I've been very happy. I have helped change regulations for better uh, waste management. We did not have a recycling system. And now we have, uh, since I started, I think we have avoided 800 tons of uh, plastic waste of going to uh, the landfill. And we're a very small municipality, but there was nothing. So yeah, that's uh, that has been very rewarding. And about uh, taking care of water, we have now one water treatment plant that we're using for irrigation. So we can use the fresh water we have for human use and health issues, not just for the parks. Uh, we've also established a rain, uh, rain water, rainfall capture uh, there was no infrastructure for that, and we started working uh, to make our city more to mitigate and adapt better for climate change because it's real, it's happening, and we can see it every day. So, yeah. So, just to to ask you an extra question on on this question I just asked you because as a councilwoman, I I, I can imagine that. Sustainability, was it already something that in your community was being discussed? And it's like, I'm going to use sustainability because also it, a lot of people will support me because they think this is important. Or you were more a person from an activist background okay, hoping to get support, but you, wasn't, you weren't sure about that yet. Yeah, well, 
There are people that think that sustainability is very important, but there are also a lot of people that are resistant to change. Right now, our recycling program is voluntary and we have like 13% of the people participate. So no, it's not like, I'm sure I'm gonna use this sustainability uh, brand and everybody will support me. Uh, no, it has, I have had to uh, educate and learn to better communicate why sustainability is important. So I've actually became a, a TikToker and an Instagrammer to try to teach sustainability. Uh, it was very hard at first. I did not like the camera at all, uh, but yeah. And I was doing like silly things and I felt so awkward, but it has helped. A lot of people, uh, the feedback I received, like I did not recycle at all. And then I saw your video and I saw that it's not that hard, that there's something I can do. So it has been working. That's interesting, especially, uh, uh with you having an activist background, that's one way of messaging, of course, about sustainability. Now you're, in, you're a councilwoman and you use these new technologies and platforms to educate mm -hmm. in a different way, because I guess the activist message is different than the councilwoman's message, right? Yes, but the, the biggest uh, problem that I've seen as an activist and as a councilwoman is how we communicate with each other. People don't want to know they don't see the news. They, they tell me like, I didn't know. And I'm like, I've been on the, on the radio, on TV, and every newspaper. I do silly Instagram videos. Uh, and you still don't know. So it, it, it's hard because mm -hmm. a lot of people know where the next Taylor Swift uh, concert is going to be, but they don't know where their re nearest recycling spot is and how they should uh, put the bottles away. It, it, funny that you mentioned that. I'm, I'm not going to ask more questions, but I mean, with this message we're competing with, for instance, Taylor Swift, I mean, nowadays the world is a very complicated place with a lot of communications being thrown at us every day, and we're competing with any kind of messaging, uh, not only sustainability messaging, it could be any messaging. And if people, before we had one or two TV channels, and we could just, we all watch the same news, we all got the same information, but nowadays you can just switch to another platform to the news that you do want to hear and you just lock out the stuff you don't want to hear so i think that there, there is a very big challenge for every one of us who, who wants yeah. to to make this planet planet a better place Re really interesting um so the next question i have is for, for jessica um uh it's more about the, the global plastics treaty process um of course we already had two rounds of negotiations uh, all the countries presented themselves a lot of other stakeholders were there present as well, businesses, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. So have you had any signals until now that equity is being part of the discussion? Are there countries or maybe organizations that you say like, hey, they were there, they put it on the agenda or, or not yet? Um, so I think I wanna answer this. Um, so I, I've had, correspondence with some of my collaborators who have been engaged in, in the process, specifically those who are um, representing small island states. And I think that, um, you know, this is sort of an ongoing issue that's uh, pretty, um, I, sort of a, a systematic issue that often um, less powerful countries have um, less influence in negotiation. So I suppose that's sort of this equity issue that's going on with current negotiations. Um, however, like I've seen the the most the zero draft and um, sort of talking about some of the the some of the dimensions that are being integrated into the treaty. Um, a just transition is part of that, and I think that that's really important and um, a real a step in the right direction. Um, that that's being um, integrated into it. Uh, one of my concerns, however, is a, a lot of what's being sort of outlined under the just, just transition um, is improvement of waste worker livelihood and uh, working conditions, which are which is clearly really critical. But it it's sort of that responsibility is being put onto um, industry to make the decisions of how to implement that. 
And so I do, I think there are concerns of what that implementation will look like because we do have models of some of these um, sort of extended producer responsibility schemes that have done sort of waste management systems in countries that um, publicly or on a, on a global scale, they're sort of being uh, really recognized for taking initiative and doing some um, really progressive work. But then when you go onto the ground and talk to people that are working in those spaces, um, they aren't livable wages, they are toxic and really dangerous working conditions. So I uh, would hope that moving forward, um, implementation looks different so that those problems aren't manifesting. Um, and I guess the other point that has been raised to me is remediation isn't a really a dominant part of the conversations. And that is, you know, that clearly links back to why marine plastic pollution is an equity issue, because that's um, that's being heavily experienced by particular countries that um, need capacity support to deal with that. Um, and as Vivian had mentioned earlier, like who's going to pay for that? And it's just sort of crickets because no one wants to talk about it. I think that you raise a really good point and something that we maybe should, should explain to people listening today or another moment. Uh, the treaty, of course, is, is a instrument, a global instrument to solve plastic pollution towards the future and implement solutions, all the types of solutions that exist to avoid more pollution in the future. But as you well said, uh, Jessica, what are we gonna do with all the pollution that already exists? Mm -hmm. And the pollution that we have been generating for the last 50 years uh, in the communities that have to live with it and who's gonna pay for it? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a really good point that you have there. It's equity, not only towards the future, but also equity to the now and, and the past mm -hmm. because there are responsibilities and accountabilities for the, for the, for the pollution that we already have. Absolutely. Great, thank you. And I, I think also really interesting that through your through the study that you did and the report that you that you co-authored, all the connections that you already made for that study, those people, of course, are still part of your network, and you still keep getting feedback, I guess, from from them uh, about their situation and if any, anything is changing, right? Yeah, um, I think that's probably the you know, the biggest value of um, sort of bringing these people together is, yeah, we have sort of this coalition of actors who are really um, motivated to make sure that equity is um, a huge part of moving forward. Um, and so I think, you know, there's often this gap between academic research and policy implementation and practice. And um, that is something that we're really trying to bridge because there is a wealth of knowledge that we're generating in academic spheres, but how do we make that um, applicable and um, relevant to policymakers? So the next step has been, we've been working with more um, stakeholders that are on the ground in developing a policy roadmap um, where we're trying to integrate a lot of these um, sort of our findings from our, our on the ground case studies into policy relevant um, principles that can then be brought to the treaty negotiations. Great. Um, I think that that's a great introduction also for the question I'm gonna ask uh, Laura. <laughs> uh, because Laura, uh, you and your team, uh, you published uh, a policy brief just before INC2 about national action plans. Um, and in a way, in that policy brief, you also warned a bit about the use of national action plans and the many barriers that exist that could hamper an effective implementation. I mean, it could be very nice to have a declaration of principles and all the nice things you're going to do with the national action plan. But what, what, is, what was the warning that you published in that brief? So... Um... The brief was basically based on a synthesis of the available evidence uh, on national action plans and their effectiveness. And we made it like concise enough so that the member state delegates can actually absorb it right before um, Paris negotiations. So um, we found that in the grand scheme of things, there are not that many actual uh, national action plans for plastics. 
And most of the existing ones, they revolve around the end of life of the plastic life cycle. And there's a lot of marine plastic litter national action plans. So from that, there's quite a few questions that arise. So for example, can we use these existing narrow scoped action plans with uncertain effectiveness to justify applying similar approaches in the treaty? And then can we apply national action plans to sufficiently cover the entire plastic life cycle and not just one or two stages? And lastly, will they effectively and realistically translate those global treaty objectives into those tailored national pathways to ending plastic pollution? So from our review and analysis, there are some key elements that arose that would now need to be discussed. Uh, in the negotiations before we start applying those national action plans. So I think it's worth repeating that ideally national action plans and their objectives, they should be legally binding and they should be supported by a national legal and institutional framework. And also not only do we need coordination with, within the member states themselves for the national action plans, but we also need true alignment of those plans and the commitments within with the Global Plastics Treaty. Um, and also ultimately we need really robust compliance measures to ensure that those na national commitments are met. And this, this sort of accountability really is necessary because otherwise it doesn't really matter what the plans say. Um, there are some other ones if I have time. <laughs> yeah, you still have some time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so also there's the, the kind of the basics of national action plans. So robust monitoring, evaluation, reporting and data sharing to, so that we ensure that the, the sufficient and evidence-based progress and updates are applied when they need to be applied and when they can be applied and that we can add the ambition as we go. And then also hand in hand with those monitoring and evaluation thing is there is the, the frequent revision that is needed so that we can then, based on our evaluation and everything and data sharing, we can then adapt the plans and have a successful national action plan. Um, also, what is quite important actually is that they should be supported by technical and financial assistance so that we can ensure that the different member states with different country contexts, that they can successfully implement and comply with those obligations. Okay, thank you, Laura. It's, it's, a, it's a long list of, of, of um, that's not barriers or challenges, but it's more of the, the rules that need to be set up for really this to make it, make it happen. And one thing I think is really important is reporting, as you, as you mentioned, and reporting on what? Many countries have no idea what's going on with plastic pollution, or they have no idea how many plastic is, is, is moving around yearly in their country, how much is being consumed, produced, exported, imported, all those movements, I think for many countries are still a challenge or a big question mark. And uh, so how can we measure something that we don't even know how much it is? I know that, that you're quite right. And that's what we in the Global Plastics Policy Centre try to do. We try to bring together the evidence and provide the support at that interface where you have government, businesses, citizens, and then us researchers. So, I mean, national action plans, it just happened to be one of the topic, topics of interest that we hadn't explored yet. So, but yeah, it's really important to get that evidence so that we can then also, before we start planning those national action plans, but then once they are being implemented, gathering that evidence more and more and more, and then basing our next step, uh, next steps on that evidence. Exactly. And, and again, the really interesting introduction to the question I have for Vivian, talking about evidence, of course, uh, Laura and also Jessica said, talked more about academic evidence and gathering evidence and helping to get that evidence and, and help communities. But Vivian, you work with this daily, uh, you see the evidence in your community, of course, uh, and, and what's happening when uh, waste is not managed correctly or plastic is overflowing your system. You, as you said, you, you're recycling uh, in your community now. But um, so, I mean, talking about evidence, what would be your message to the world and country leaders about effective implementation and how it should take place? Because that's what you work with, right? effective implementation you need to solve this problem um so what is your what's your opinion about that what is your message there? 
Yeah, well, I think we all need to recognize the urgency of uh, changing, but I'm working right now with uh, data that I had collected like in a national uh, scope from 2020. There's no more information. I've been gathering the information I have in our uh, municipality, but I, I wanted to uh, see what infrastructure we need, like how many tons of plastic or uh, like paper and whatever we are recycling. And there's no data in, in my country because gathering data and placing data, it takes up money. And I see with envy the a lot of regulations you have in different countries of the extended producer responsibility that's not not something we have in mexico we do have a lot of uh businesses that are international and that they want to comply with their esgs so they work in a voluntary way and as a municipality that has uh limited resources assigned to recycling or waste management, we need to work together, even if it's voluntary, even if they, I think they could be doing more. If we have the regulations uh, as they have, I don't know, in Europe, they would be doing more, but th that's what we have to work with. And I know uh, if I made recycling uh, mandatory, I would not have, the infrastructure or the, cap the capacity in people and in vans and places to hold or confine the, the recycling process. So if I do it mandatory, I would be affecting myself. So what we have, we've been doing in a local level is trying to build on these capacities. So when we are able, make it mandatory. So it, it, it's kind of like capturing these things. What do you do first? Do you make it mandatory or do you start to educate? Because we have a, a recycling bus that we like a regular uh, residue uh, cycle like you go by house by house and I buy it on it. And I go and knock the door and tell the, the person in the house like, this is not the way you should put recycling. You have to clean it first. Uh, if the pizza box has the pizza inside, it's not, it does not go in the recycling. So we have that issue and we've been working with that, but there's nobody to pay for it. Who is responsible for all the plastic that we are producing? What we've been saying is that consumer is the one that it's responsible. And they assume that the government is responsible or supplying the, the solution. But I think it's all of us. And the, mostly the people that makes the plastic, they are the ones that are supposed to be in charge of making it sure that we recycle. And they've been trying. I had a meeting with uh, the Tetra Pak company, the, Tetra, the, the bricks, and they, they are helping us to, pick up the Tetra packs that we have here so we can recycle them. It's hard. I think what you mentioned is ESG as, as a possible solution. I think it's something that, that is a bit of a buzzword lately in, in the uh, uh, in private sector. I think uh, it could be a very interesting tool if it's combined with mandatory and legislation and, and of course stakeholders and shareholders. I mean, we don't have time to go into ESG today in this panel, but I mean, the, the, the 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 shared responsibility is not only of course consumers and companies and, and 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 governments but also the shareholders themselves that still think in a traditional business way in a way that of course it doesn't force companies enough to to bring about change so i think that's where also we have maybe a great opportunity uh, in the future as well to to deal with this if they see it as charity they see it as charity exactly charity. voluntary charity Exactly. I think Jessica wants to uh, say something, but before I give you the mic, Jessica, give me one second, because we still have 15 minutes left and I want to invite at least everybody who is watching right now in Zoom, leave any questions in the Q&A uh, for us to answer because there's still some, some time left. So if there's any questions, please write them there and we'll try to, to answer them as well.
Jessica. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. Obviously, we don't have time to talk about ESG and all these voluntary things, but I, you know, it's often posed as this possible solution, like, you know, developing an international treaty is it's gonna take time for it even to get to the point that we're implementing it. And we have multinational corporations that have the capacity, who have, have the financing and who have already the infrastructure globally to possibly do something. And, um, and so there are places where that is the reality of that is the only resource and infrastructure that's available, but then we're posed with this constant tension that there are still, there's still a bottom line and there's still these incentives that they need to um, make economic progress and continue to um, capital or accumulate capital. And so this tension exists. And um, then and I think this kind of ties back into what Laura was saying about national action um, plans and um, the, the voluntary mechanisms that are sort of embedded in them kind of allow these uh, corporate um, corporate commitments and corporate structures to sort of continue to operate in this way. Um, I sort of, I kind of lost my train of thought when, um, but yeah, I just kind of, it that sort of made me think about sort of the realities that it's such a complex problem. There is this tension that this could be a really, um, valuable tool, but at the same time, it's it could pose a lot more problems. Yeah, exactly. I think if if you see ESG within a traditional business model, it will have a very different outcome than if you would look at ESG in a new kind of business model uh, and and where uh, shareholders uh, value is is different what they look for. Um, I, I mean. Again, we don't have time to talk about the circular economy and how that could change as well for businesses and all the innovation that they could be doing uh, if they can make easy money following the traditional linear economy business model, of course. So um, I think they, they have, we have a very interesting point. And well, again, we can continue this discussion offline uh, after this panel as, as well. Um, so um, we're getting some questions, so that's good. Um, while I'm asking you at least one of my questions, I'm going to be reading those and see if I can throw it in there uh, in between the questions I have for you all. Um, so my question for Laura is, um, of course, you published your policy brief on national action plans before INC2. You were there at INC2 in Paris. You've been able to talk to many stakeholders. Uh, now we're moving towards INC3. Um, so what has been the feedback on this policy brief? So our brief has been really well received by member state delegations, and we have been having discussions with some of them to help to inform their position on national action plans as a tool to implement the treaty. Um, we also had the, I remember children and youth um, major group used the, some of the briefs content uh, in their statement during one of the contact group sessions in Paris. So that was that was really lovely to hear. And now we're using these findings to review a series of national action plan type documents um, that have been developed by governments. And we're doing this in partnership with an international organization. Great. And it has, and this feedback that you had and these new collaborations, I think today's panel is one of those collaborations because we, we met each other also in there in Paris and I learned about your policy brief. Um, towards INC3, uh, are you planning to, to submit or do a, a, an updated version of the, this policy brief or anything new coming out that you can already let us know about? So we have a similar policy brief in the pipeline that's I think it should be coming out relatively soon um equally concise <laughs> because we we want to keep that like an easily uh, digestible in in short amount of time type of style and um then there in terms of the national action plans brief we haven't planned anything to publish in terms of as a policy brief before the INC2 but we are working on an article journal article around the national action plans and their effectiveness. So that will come out in some point. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's pretty much 
it. We've got loads of stuff in the pipeline um, and I'm not entirely sure which ones I can talk about. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll be following you anyway and anything we can publish about that, we will definitely be doing. Um, so I have a question, I think for all three of you, um, that uh, was received by Dean Johnson. He's asking, beyond, beyond behaviors we can adopt as individuals, what are some proven ways which people can get involved or organized to reduce plastic waste on both the local and global level? So from a individual point of view, or how can we organize ourselves in a way to, I don't know, in case of Vivian, maybe help the, your municipality, your community, those, those actions, or anything else uh, we can do in an organized manner as consumers? Well, um... What has been working for us is if the community would not participate in the recycling program, it would not work. So I need to maintain like a baseline. So as individuals, what also helps is if you talk with other people and encourage the whole community, the whole uh, neighborhood. I have some uh, neighborhoods that by themselves, they have uh, like a talk to each other and they are responsible for, uh, because we have the, the, the route, the recycling route, but we also have uh, recycling centers, like small centers. And I have one whole neighborhood that they are, they are really taking charge. They sent me pictures like three times a day of how their recycling center is because like, come the weekend and it's all full and I have to send the truck more than once a day to help them out. But they have taken into account, like they, they are accountable for the whole community and they go um, house by house, talking to their own neighbors, explaining what are we recycling? Why does this work? And they also give um, like small talks of the responsibility we have of uh, like, buying less plastic or they also have a community um, garden that they work on with and they also do their own compost so they've been changing their whole neighborhood for being more sustainable so there i know that if there's anything sustainable that i need to do i just go with them they are the ones that are going to help me with uh saving uh, water or changing habits but as a community Sometimes when we are by ourselves, we think, well, if I recycle, it's not going to change anything. But when we work as a community, then we do change the world. I think you have a very strong point there. Something that, I mean, I, I live in Chile, South America, and something that we see as well with something called a local neighborhood environmental committees that in Chile, at least by law, are a... a formal organization that any municipality can have and that work together with the municipality. So in Spanish, we would call it Comité Ambiental Comunal. Uh, it's, a, it's a local environmental committee organized by the neighbors and that are also work with the municipality to impose, in, in, implement these kind of policies that come from municipality, but also that they have their own initiatives uh, to, to reduce waste. I mean, of course, I mean, this, this is something that goes beyond recycling. Uh, this is something that people observe in their neighborhoods. If they live close to a mall, they see different kind of waste. They live close to a beach, they see totally different kind of waste, maybe from tourism. Um, so again, when we talk about different kind of solutions, also because of different kind of organizations of communities. Um, and, and, and I think that's something that also ties a bit into uh, Jessica's work and what you mentioned before about, okay, so the, this academic work that you do, how does that translate into local action? And, and, and you mentioned something about that you're about to draft, uh, publish a draft for a roadmap. Uh, maybe, you, can you say something more about that? Like how this, the work that you did now is turning into a roadmap to really help communities? Sure. Um, yeah, so most of the collaborators from our um, report, along with some other stakeholders who are involved in um, government and NGOs, we um, conducted a series of these of workshops. They were, we did three six hour meetings every um, couple of months. It was a very, it was a kind of this um, 
uh, we were kind of the guinea pigs of our research institute of like, how can we kind of try to have this, um, uh, this, yeah, these processes of engagement and, and just deep conversation of thinking of we have, this is what we're thinking about within our research institutions. How does that actually apply to what you're experiencing on the ground and what, and sort of filter out um, what is applicable. So um, it, yeah, so we did this series of meetings and in between we sort of had asynchronous um, um, working groups as well, where we sort of um, did different exercises, but ultimately we, we came up with these uh, four different areas that we think really need to be worked on um, in order to solve the, the plastic pollution crisis. Uh, the first being capacity strengthening. So really working on a lot of communities and countries, they have drive and motivation and capacity to do things, but they really need um, just more of a support rather than this way of thinking that they need to be developed. Um, and that was sort of this language that a, a lot of our um, collaborators felt really strongly about. Um, another dimension is clear definitions. Um, and I think that this kind of gets, is, gets what's, um, or this is kind of where a lot of information gets lost because there's um, a lot of incongruencies across how people are defining different plastic materials, what is recyclable? What is what does even recycling mean? Does that mean that it's been sent to a facility or that it's been fully processed? Um, there's just a lot of um, yeah, it's kind of this black box that we're kind of we all assume we're thinking the same thing, but we're, we are not. Um, and the other part is um, international treaty principles. So really defining how can we think about equity dimensions across the international treaty. I kind of mentioned some of these things, um, prevention and precautionary principles. How do we integrate that into the language of the treaty? Um, polluter pay principles. How do we um, integrate not only incentive mechanisms, but regulatory mandates um, that ensures that uh, plastic pollution is dealt with in an equitable and effective way, but also um, that we're reducing production of, of virgin plastics and just single use toxic and wasteful plastics. Um, there's a bunch of other things that I could talk about, but we have only a little bit of time. And then finally, corporate accountability. And this is something I've really harped on quite a bit because um, that's kind of the focus of my research. Um, but yeah, just ensuring that uh, we're, integrating or implementing extended producer responsibility systems and other forms of um, corporate accountability in a way that's meaningful and actually translates to transformative actions. Um, and, and part of that also is um, ensuring an equitable decision-making process and that corporations don't have a disproportionate say in a lot of these decision-making um, processes. I've seen um, in some countries that I am working in drafting of national action plans that there are many corporate stakeholders that are heavily involved in um, the drafting and framing of solutions. And we need to think, what does that sort of, what types of solutions does that create? Um, and how do we need to sort of mitigate that disproportionate power and influence? Um, yes. So. I don't only have one minute, so I'll leave it there, sorry. <laughs> no, thank, thank you very much, Jessica. And, and normally when you, when you have these kind of panels, you go towards the end of the panel with a final conclusion, but there's so much information I think that we talked about today. I have more open questions that I, I, I want to investigate and keep talking with everybody, everybody about that we unfortunately can't handle today in, in this panel. Uh, but I would love to continue the discussion and the conversation with each and every one of you and also the people that have been participating today in, in this Zoom and, and online in, in YouTube and, and other places. Um, but before I say goodbye and, and thank, of course, our panelists, I would like to share with everybody uh, in the following slides at least some extra information about the work that Laura, Jessica, and Vivian do. So if we can have the next slide so people can see um, the, the work, there we have it. We can make it a bit bigger. That you, everybody can write down at least 
In the case of Laura's work, this is the, 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 the policy brief on national action plans. Uh, Jessica, the, um, the, the report on equity and uh, green plastic pollution report. So people can write that down as well. And last but not least, where you can follow Vivian and all the work that she does in her community uh, on Instagram, X, and TikTok, if you want to see the videos that Vivian talked about at the beginning of the panel. Um, again, uh, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you for having me uh, moderating this panel today and accepting this invitation and also letting everybody know that as this panel is part of our Trees and Seas Festival, in one hour, we will have another amazing panel about advocacy and local gaps and barriers, but it's a Spanish panel, Spanish spoken panel with subtit subtitles. So if you want to log on, see different panelists with different points of view, you can do that. And tomorrow we will have a panel about film activism, film activism and how films captivate, educate and inspire people into making a difference with our CEO, Julie Anderson and filmmaker David J. Ruck tomorrow. So all panels will save, be saved on our Plastic Oceans International YouTube channel. So you can always rewatch them if you want to learn, learn more and share them, of course, with your contacts. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. And hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.